Leslie said, um, part of part of what we were trying to do with this panel and this repeat uh, of the presentations was to share lessons learned. And so, um, what what Leslie learned, I think, from Iowa, um, we learned from Chris Peeler in, in uh, New Orleans. And so, again, appreciate all the the people that have gone before and trying to deal with some of these issues of dealing with extreme events. Um, for Iowa, we really had one of our major events in 2008, and you can see on this map sort of the outline of the state of Iowa coming out of the winter of 2007, uh, which was one of the most snowy, cold winters that we had. Uh, we had all this rain that sort of fell across the midsection, and especially the northeast part of the state, and really set us up for some, some pretty uh, statewide flooding in, in 2008. And as that event started to unfold, we really thought back to the floods of 1993 and that we didn't really have good information to assess what our fluxes coming out of the state of Iowa were in terms of impacting the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia. And so um, as the flood started to build in, in north central Iowa, we thought, let's get ahead of this and collect some data across the state. So the dots on the map really show you where we tried to take our ambient sites that were existing for the state of Iowa, our ambient water monitoring points, and uh, start to collect data there for that long-term flood impact. Um, what we found is that we quickly had to learn during the disaster. And so what, what this map is, is showing you is the city of Cedar Rapids, um, the city, Cedar River running through the city of Cedar Rapids, and this is the forecast. Um, the flood uh, forecast that they had at one time, and, and really they said, you know, we thought flood was going to uh, peak at 22 feet, which would mean it would be below the levees. Um, the city government, which is in the middle of the river here um, on this island, was going to still be protected. And instead what happened is on about June 10th and 11th, there were some major flash floods that occurred in the area, and the stage ended up being pushed to more than 30 feet. Um, and really was in unknown territory in terms of what impacts that was going to have and ended up being a, a major disaster for the city of Cedar Rapids. So quickly, we went from moving uh, in, in terms of monitoring from a long-term interesting study looking at the Gulf of Mexico impact to a real-time decision-making model, <clears throat> excuse me, and looking at public, self, public health and safety issues. Um, and then calculating some short-term health impacts. And so the picture is of Cedar Rapids. Um, the downtown area was entirely flooded as well and uh, became uh, quite critical to get some information out to folks. In terms of our logistics, uh, we actually started sampling on about June 9th when the, the northern part of the state started to see some flooding. Uh, we accelerated our sampling from our DNR ambient sites, which is normally a monthly sampling regime, to weekly monitoring and submitting those samples to the State Hygienic Laboratory at the University of Iowa. Uh, we expanded greatly our list of analytes, so things that we normally don't include in our ambient monitoring program like gasoline and semi-volatiles and, and uh, extractable hydrocarbons and metals um, were included back because we thought, of course, that might be an issue for us. And then, uh, again, we started to look at the flood samples versus the post-flood samples. And, uh, sort of the take-home message for us was that during the flood peak, which was in many ways almost like a flash flood because the, the peaks dissipated rather rapidly, uh, which in contrast to 93 stuck around for months and months, um, in 2008 uh, the flood waters came up and came right back down. Uh, and we had about an 85% non-detection rate for those analytes in the flood waters, and by the time we were in August about a 92% detection rate. And not surprisingly, we found lots of nutrients and bacteria and herbicides and the things that we would find in pretty much any event in, in the state of Iowa during a rainfall event uh, in the spring and summer. And really in contrast to the media that talked about this toxic soup of chemicals that were out there in the water and the, the hysteria that was being generated that if people touched the water or smelled the water, they were going to become instantly sick. And, and so we were trying to get the best information out to folks about what was really in the water. Uh, we did have isolated detections of metals and some of the semi-volatiles and gasoline and things like that. But one of the, the messages for us is that we started to find things after the flood peak went away. And so we had hundreds of thousands of, of barrels, of containers, of things that were stranded in the streams from uh, being washed out of sheds and and all over the state, and those detections actually increased 
of these more exotic things that we tended not to look for in our ambient program um, months after the flood peak. And so part of the lessons learned for us were that we needed to stay with that monitoring um, after sort of the, the public memory of the issue was starting to fade away. So again, as an example, if we look at some of the, the pesticides uh, moving in the state, we had mean concentrations um, that were not especially high from what some of the concentrations we might see in a typical year in the state, um, and then dropping pretty rapidly as we got through the, the later summer months. Um, but one of the things that we did see is some impact uh, that happened months later, like we saw some pretty significant algae blooms, and we saw some pretty significant cyanobacteria blooms in some of our major rivers. And uh, again, Bob Hirsch talked a little bit about the drinking water um, for the Des Moines, uh, Des Moines, city of Des Moines being the Raccoon River. Um, the Raccoon had a very significant cyanobacteria bloom in the summer, late summer of 2008, which actually threatened the drinking water for microcystin toxin. Um, and again, a lot of the public memory of the flood had passed because the peaks were so short-lived but we were definitely seeing that impact in, in the chlorophyll numbers um, months later after the flood peak had kind of moved through. We also saw some, some need from uh, our public health partners and our first responders to get additional sampling due to public health concerns. Um, we had a, a number of our very large cities bypassing to streams. And so for example, the city of Cedar Rapids that I showed you, because the peak was tw 20 feet um, higher than they were hoping to have, uh, they lost the wastewater treatment pl plant completely. So it was um, bypass of perhaps a euphemism for complete loss of control of wastewater for a, 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 a significant town for the uh, state of Iowa. And one of the things that happened is people that were downriver uh, were seeing dead animals along the river, became very concerned about the the issues of the wastewater being in their community. And the Cedar River has a lot of shallow sandy alluvium and people have uh, wells that connect hydrologically to the Cedar River. So there was a lot of concern about what was in that, that river water downstream of Cedar Rapids. Uh, we were also having bypasses in the Iowa City Coralville area as well as Des Moines. And so we did some uh, additional public health sampling for bacteria in those areas. And this just gives you an example of the Cedar Rapids uh, situation. The green arrow shows you about where the flood happened. So the blue line being sampling upstream of the city of Cedar Rapids, and the pink line being sampling downstream of the city of Cedar Rapids. And again, um, the flood peak really was only about a two week long period, and uh, people wanted to get back on the river um, to do recreation, to do boating, and we were talking on a nearly daily basis with the fire chief of Cedar Rapids because he did not want people to get back on the water, partly from a flood debris standpoint, but also because it as you can see, the bacteria levels continue to rise and rise and rise um, as the the, um, the stream flow in the Cedar River was decreasing throughout the summer months. Um, that, that basically unfettered wastewater was becoming increasingly a problem for the quality of the Cedar River. And uh, they did a great job of actually getting that plant back online and started disinfection again on September 15th. And you can see the dramatic impact on the bacteria levels but it became a big challenge for us in terms of communicating the public health risk when many of the folks that were no longer being uh, inconvenienced by the flood because they were not drinking, uh, wanted to get back out and recreate on the water. And so uh, we had to work to get this information into the right hands so people could make the best decisions about recreation. We had a number of other uh, interesting sort of things that happened to us. Oakville, Iowa is located in the, in the very far southeast corner of the state um, in the alluvial plain of the Mississippi River and the Iowa River uh, where they come together. <clears throat> and there were a number of confined animal feeding operations. Um, as the flood peaks started to come, there was concern about the lagoons becoming swamped with the floodwaters. Uh, and so they let the, uh, the hogs out of the building to essentially run free. Um, hogs not being especially stupid went to the levees and uh, were on oh. the levees and there was concern then about them breaking down the levees and the, the hogs were shot to not break down the levees. So then we had a number of um, thousands of rotting hogs on the levees and then there was concern about what that would do um, in terms of water quality and public health risks and so we were asked to get in there and assess 
what the impact of those <coughs> hogs were having on water quality and certainly not something that we expected. And with all of our on, <coughs> we were asked to quickly come up with plans for things that we had never really considered. Uh, again, we had a number of, of tanks. Uh, this was an, a pretty classic example in the state where um, these tanks would be abandoned along riversides or on, on bridges. And again, um, immediately the impact was diluted, but as those floodwaters receded, we saw um, detections of, of these compounds in our stream. So we had to think about uh, water health impacts. We didn't have a lot in terms of short-term health guidelines to work with, so we worked with EPA to develop some short-term health guidelines. Um, a lot of the health guidelines we have are for drinking water, which was not necessarily the concern. It was more dermal exposure, um, people getting in there, swamping out their houses, working in flood restoration uh, efforts. And so we were happy to find that none of the short-term health guidelines that we calculated were exceeded or even close, but it was a challenge to do that in a rapid sort of uh, fashion. And then the other thing that happened was a lot of concern about the sediment that was left behind and whether what there was contamination in that sediment, uh, whether people could uh, garden in their backyards again, uh, there were community gardens, there were playgrounds, uh, what, whether there was an issue for uh, people to be in that sediment. And so we did um, pretty extensive sediment samples in some of our urban areas. Again, largely did not detect very much uh, in terms of contamination, but we did see some very high levels of bacteria especially in some of the playgrounds that were located along our, our rivers. And so uh, we had to think about how to communicate uh, guidance to, to folks um, when they should go back into that, um, that playground area, how they could remediate the bacteria in those playground areas, um, and give people some sense of confidence that those areas were not highly contaminated. Uh, we had low levels, uh, low levels of uh, metals and motor oil and some, um, some pesticides, but um, very much below our state standards for um, sediment. Now, these aren't really, again, dermal exposure uh, standards. It's, again, looking from a cleanup standpoint from our underground storage tank uh, program or contaminated sites program. So, again, I think we need to have more work done here in looking at what our short-term exposure to some of these, uh, these chemicals would be. But we didn't find very high levels of most of those uh, chemicals that we uh, tested for. Much like Leslie, we had a number of lessons learned. Uh, part of it was increasing the information flow to frontline responders. And so uh, we were not really expecting to try and get our water monitoring information to the city and county health folks or the, the fire department or the police department, and they were very hungry for that information. One of the challenges we had is how you got the information to them uh, and how you got it to the public. And uh, we had a Rebuild Iowa office that was established in the wake of the floods of 2008. And one of the questions they really hammered on us was, uh, our expectation in this day and age is we're really happy if we can post our monitoring data on the web. And they were um, taking us to task that you can't rely on putting things on the web for flood victims when they no longer have a computer. They might not even have a radio. So they talked with us about how we could perhaps get information out in pamphlets to community leaders or putting them on, on uh, telephone poles or something to get that information out to folks. Again, we had to work on short-term health benchmarks, um, something that we did not have, and now we've got some uh, a leg up if we have, and we have had a couple of other floods since 2008. Uh, we needed to create guidelines for cleanup. So what did it mean in terms of the sediment cleanup in areas so that people felt health? felt uh, safe, and then also looking at sort of the human health issues versus the environmental health issues. And again, there was a lot of focus on human health, but then there were lingering questions about the environmental impacts on our fish population and our wildlife population. Uh, one of the big challenges is that we had to talk to folks about, because we didn't see a particular contaminant in the Cedar River did not mean that it was safe to go in your basement and that your basement may actually have had quite a bit of contamination from whatever containers were in there. So trying to clarify to people that the monitoring data was not exhaustive and uh, you couldn't necessarily be confident that if you went into your garage or basement that those things wouldn't show up. Um, like Leslie talked about, we had to improve our monitoring. Um, our lab was pretty comfortable in turning results around in a couple weeks which was not acceptable for our frontline responders. And so we had to really push them to accelerate their QA reviews so that we could get data in a much more timely manner. 
and then we had to target those areas of concern like the Oakville area um, or areas with wastewater bypasses and so um, having like Leslie said those GIS maps that were uh, available to us to figure out how to get to that location when the roads were out was, was really helpful and then again differentiating between those flood and post flood concerns um, the immediate flood peak versus the uh, two to three to four months later um, impacts. Uh, Bob talked a lot about um, concentrations and loads, and so I won't go into that other than to say, again, from a communication standpoint, we saw relatively, um, we saw elevated concentrations, but not the highest concentrations we'd ever seen of many of these chemicals because of the dilution impact. But in terms of the loads being generated, they were astronomical, and again, that was a a communication challenge for us to tell people about the difference between um, the concentration load paradigm there and then the logistical issues of what to sample how do you get there and where to sample as Leslie talked about and then one of the big challenges for us was who pays for the monitoring because very few of us have a, uh, a rainy day fund for spending a lot of money on water quality monitoring for a flood and in the end, what helped us is that we did um, extensive documentation of what our monitoring for floods was above and beyond our ambient program, and we were able to make the case to FEMA that this was not part of our routine program, and they paid for everything that was above and beyond the ambient program, but we had to document that very carefully, and uh, there was a leap of faith between us and our contract lab about, you know, you will get paid, we're not sure how, but it will hopefully work out in the end. Uh, and again, this is just an a, a aerial shot of the Cedar Rapids. Um, very challenging to try and, and sample in that area. And then again, appreciate our field crews who did uh, a lot of work trying to get out to some of these areas. And, and you know, I defy you to figure out where the river is in that particular shot, where you sample um, in a way that, that really is representative of the water quality in that particular location. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Monty.